The first three videos in this unit talked about solutions at ordinary points. That's the standard technique and applies to most situations. However, there are some important DEs that involve P and Q which are not analytic at the center point of a series. That is, I want to solve this DE with a Taylor series centered at a singular point. However, not all singular points are created equal. There are certain conditions where a solution at a single po singular point will work, and I need some new definitions to explain these conditions. So here's a new definition. Let f be any function, and let t naught be some point that is not in the domain of f. For p and q, this is one way of having a singular point for the differential equation. The point t naught is called a pole for the function f of order d, if d is the smallest natural number for which this limit exists. What does this say? Well, it basically says that t naught is an asymptote, and I can get rid of that asymptote by multiplication by a high enough power of t minus t naught. And d is the smallest power that I need to get rid of the asymptote. The typical example is f equals 1 over t to the d. This has a pole of order d at t equals 0. Similarly, if the denominator is t minus t naught, then the pole of order d is at t naught. This is how you should think of a pole. It's something like a power in the denominator, however it is more general, since functions other than just powers can still have poles. It measures sort of the degree of the asymptote at a certain point. How does this help? Well, it leads to another definition back in the differential equation world. I have singular points, and I want a singular point that is not too bad, not too problematic. These will be called regular singular points. And apologies for the names, ordinary, now regular. These are not the best descriptive names, but as with much of mathematics, we are stuck with them. The setup is the same, homogeneous second order linear equation, P and Q as defined before. A point is a regular singular point, if it is a singular point, of course, which means that at least one of P and Q are not analytic at the point. But it needs to be one of these cases. P needs to be analytic or have a pole of order 1, and Q needs to be analytic or have a pole of order 1 or 2. That is, these two functions need to be analytic at t naught, multiplying by a 1 power for t and multiplying by 2 powers for t naught needs to basically get rid of the undefined point, get rid of the asymptote, for both P and Q. This is the technical addition that will allow the process in this video to work. It means that the problems with P and Q aren't too bad. The asymptotes are controllable. There is one more way of understanding what is going on here, which is valuable to share before I get into the actual technique for the video. This is the form of a Taylor series. However, what if I wanted to let the sum also include negative powers? No reason why I can't. Such a series where there are both positive and negative powers of t minus t naught is called a Laurent series. Of course, since there are negative powers, the series is no longer defined at t naught at the center, but otherwise there is still a whole theory of these series, since radius, convergence, derivatives, integral properties, all of the rest of those still work. Laurent series are particularly nice for identifying poles. If there are only a few negative powers, then the Laurent series has a pole, and that might makes sense. Multiplying by the power will make these negative terms positive, thus removing the domain problem, removing the asymptote. Let me go back to the differential equation now for a moment. I said that P can have a pole of order 1, and Q can have a pole of order at most 2. I can express this very nicely with Laurent series. Let me do this just at the point 0 for clarity. I know that T times P must be analytic, and T squared times Q must be analytic. In terms of Laurent series, this essentially limits the negative exponents that are possible. P can have at most one negative exponent, and Q can have at most two. Therefore, the P and Q functions have to have Laurent series that look like this, and I will call these the Laurent forms for the coefficient functions P and Q. We're going to need the P minus one and the Q minus two coefficients in the future. By using these Laurent series, I can calculate these coefficients via, via limits, which is very convenient. Now the setup is done, so I can get into the technique. The idea is to use a series, but with extra power. 
this is an ordinary Taylor series, but I multiply by t minus alpha to the power r, where r is literally any real number. Importantly, r doesn't have to be a whole number. It could be a fraction or even an irrational number. This extra flexibility in the solution setup, this extra power, will allow for solutions at regular singular points. This technique is called the method of Frobenius. So what do I do? Well, of course, I put the series into the DE and see what happens, as always. I'm going to do the general situation here at alpha equals zero, just for a bit of clarity in the notation, although it does work at an arbitrary center point, of course. Here is the series and its derivatives. Note that I don't change the starting index this time. Since the exponent is t to the n plus r, and r could be literally any real number, there's no guarantee that there are constants which will be removed by successive differentiation. Then I put these all into the DE. After putting it in, I'll put P and Q into their Laurent forms. Again, the condition here is that this is a regular singular point, so P and Q have these series forms. And that's key in this technique. Without these series forms for P and Q, the whole technique doesn't work. That said, this is still a mess, particularly since I have a product of series in both the second and the third terms. However, I can get some insight by looking at the t to the r minus 2 coefficient. That's the first term of each of these three series, n equals 0 in each. In the first series, this will be c0 times r times r minus 1. In the second, it will be the product of the first two terms here, which is going to be p negative 1 times r times c0. And for the third, it will, the, the coefficient again shows up in the first term of each series multiplied together, so I get q negative 2 times c0. These are the three terms that I will pull out. These must be equal to 0. These are the coefficients of t to the r minus 2, and all coefficients must be 0. I can factor out c0, and I can factor out t to the r minus 2. c0 can be zero, cannot be 0 in this method, since that would disrupt the choice of r at the start. Therefore, in order to satisfy the differential equation, I get this equation. What is this? This is a quadratic in R. Again, a complicated DE works its way down to a quadratic equation that captures the most important information. This quadratic determines R, and once R is determined, then this essentially looks like a series solution that we've done so far. And I will process it the same way. Find the recurrence relation, calculate the coefficients, and so on. This quadratic is called the indicial equation. All I need to know to set it up is the, are the two coefficients, p minus 1 and q minus 2, and these can be calculated by the limits that I wrote down earlier. And as with all of these techniques, the general derivation I've done in this video doesn't need to be repeated. You could just calculate p minus 1 and q minus 2, write down this quadratic, calculate r, and then move on to solve the series for each root r. This will almost always work. There are some situations where this method doesn't produce two independent solutions. There is just some discussion of those cases in the notes, but I'm not going to worry about it too much for these videos. Please read that section of the notes if you want to understand all the 